Uh, we'll start off with a public comment period. Anybody from the public? You want to make something? Yeah, me too. Okay. Me too. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Lily Lombard. I live at 39 Monroe Street. Um, I understand on your agenda today is discussion of the city's draft climate plan. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, I wanted to share that the Tree Commission took a really close look at the plan and, and submitted about 12 pages worth of comments, um, which I understand that Chris distributed to you, and I hope that you will take the opportunity to look at. Um, uh, we would love to see urban forestry inserted much more prominently in the plan. We feel like it's a very important element in climate uh, mitigation, adaptation, resilience. Um, another point that we uh, want to make uh, clear, and I think this is going to be echoed by Climate Action Now, is that we feel that all plans going forward, including this one, need to have very clear timelines, metrics, goals. And that although these things don't seem like they're, um, uh, they have resources behind them for uh, you know, for, for easily doing that, we nevertheless feel that the times are urgent enough to demand this of, the, of us and we find resources to make them happen. We prioritize resources to, um, to make them happen. So um, I do want to reiterate that, that is one of our seminal pieces of feedback about the, the draft climate plan, that it is, does not have sufficient clear metrics goals and timelines. And I did refer everybody in my um, notes to the Evanston, Illinois climate plan, which is rich in those things and I think is a model to emulate. I know that it has um, received national attention for its quality as a, as a climate plan. So I, um, I urge the, uh, the, this commission not just to give individual pieces of feedback about the plan, but as a commission to turn in some group consensus um, feedback that um, demonstrates more the will of this commission than you know individuals. I think there's value in that. All right, thank you. Anybody else from the phone? Hi everyone, my name is Adele Franks and um, I would uh, like to uh, uh, reaffirm what Lily said and also um, I would like to comment that as I was reading the uh, draft climate resiliency and regeneration plan I uh, came upon the section about the um, grants that our city has received for the fire station um, and also for a microgrid connecting the hospital and Smith Open and PPW and realized that as I read about it that these grants were um, given quite a long time ago and for quite large sums of money and that even though I come to these meetings fairly often, I, I had no idea what the status of these <laughs> projects were and I was wondering if I could, uh, if uh, you would accept a suggestion to put that an update on the, on the future agenda so that the public could know more about the status of these very important projects. Thank you. Yeah, you're in the right place, huh? Is this ZBA? No. No, yeah, that's in the hearing room. No, but it's in the hearing room. All right, maybe I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is for a reason. <laughs> so oh, I'm um, Sharon Moulton, and I live at 48 Evergreen Road, number 313. And I'm the on the steering committee of Climate Action Now, and I'm the Climate Action Now representative on the statewide um, coalition for putting a price on carbon pollution. And um, the coalition, one of the things that they thought of is that it hasn't. We got 93 representatives. 80 is half. 90. That doesn't count the senators who signed on without our even asking. Um, but it, uh, for the Jen Benson, put a price on carbon pollution and use some of the money for green infrastructure bill. It, but it hasn't seemed to make a difference to the leadership. They don't seem to say, oh, this is something we need to do right away. So in thinking of what could make a difference, 
having the support of the Mass Municipal Association is something that we've come up with. And I've talked with David, he's on the board of directors, and so there's stuff going directly through the MMA. But there has been a, a local elected and appointed official uh, endorsement form. And I forwarded it to Chris a few minutes ago, and I know it's not on the agenda, so we can't um, discuss it. But I want to just, maybe we can have it on the agenda in a month. Each one of you individually could sign the letter. But also, because the commission itself voted to support putting a price on carbon pollution several sessions ago, you could sign on all together and you could decide. If, I mean, you could do both, sign all to, on all together and individually. But I wanted to bring that up. Thank you. So that's a, from the MMA? The endorsement no, it's, form is it, the endorsement form is from the Massachusetts for Clean Energy Future. It's for somebody from Kava, the okay. business. Okay, so this is separate from the MMA. It, 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 it's okay. partly to influence, so the results of it are going to be shared with MMA and probably with the legislature. But okay. Anybody else from there? Okay. I'll introduce this is Audrey. She's interning with me and his and hers. She's after interning with Google early in the summer. She's interning with uh, his and hers this fall. She's in Smith College too. Um, studying computer science and sustainability. Do you pay as well as who? Um, <laughs> um, no one's <laughs> Supposed to be grant funded. That didn't work out. So aligned with our concentration. All right. Um, I would accept the motion to approve the minutes of July 11th. Um, mm -hmm. okay. Second. Uh, any discussion, comments, adjustments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Sounded unanimous. Um, okay. Um, a couple of votes here. Um, uh, so, not sure if everybody knows or not, but we just put in four new charging ports. So basically, four, uh, two new charging stations that cover four parking spaces. Uh, two in the James House lot, and two at uh, two in the parking garage. Um, uh, at the same time, around the same time, um, Central Services was working with. Um, a local organization that worked for uh, accessibility for handicap parking. And there was a desire expressed for handicap parking to have an EV charger as well. So the two that, are, that have been in the garage for a long time, they weren't the highest quality. And um, when we had to continue replacing one of them, or one of them, at one point we said, we're just going to go with a low ball. We went and we put in with this Levitron which I don't think is really meant for commercial applications, and it's been problematic. So, in, in general, the parking folks would, you know, feel that they're not up to the task of the heavy use that they get there, but they probably could handle the task of providing services for handicap, because it would be a smaller audience. So, the idea is that we hope to move those two chargers to handicap places and put in another charger. Um, uh, the charge point, um, which would also then, the charge point has, also has the advantage of um, allowing us to charge for electricity when we get to that point. We pay for five years of data in order to get the incentives that the National Grid wants, you know, is giving out. You have to buy five-year data plan, um, sales management plans, and then you can, you can sell your different stuff. Um, it gets all kind of convoluted. Uh, the mayor supports this um, effort of using a revolving fund, um, 10000 And when I first conceived of it, it was going to be $10,000 uh, to backstop the full cost that we would then get reimbursed. Without going into the details, there's some, the revolving fund's got some special considerations on how money can get into it, which makes that impossible. We need to go get to a contractor, et cetera, and in, in the national grid's incentives, I'm being kind of vague here because I don't really have it all um, uh, locked down, 
Um, National Grid has got incentives that change with the number of chargers you put in, and if you put in two chargers and four points, you could actually get them to pay for that five-year data plan um, as well. Uh, so, and yet we don't have this all ironed out, but I'm coming here to ask if uh, the commission would approve up to $10,000 to be used to fund charging stations. I'm not going to say specifically at any certain spot, but most likely one's going to go in the garage, and possibly it would be a second one going in someplace else, um, uh, which is yet to be determined. Um, but it's basically earmarking $10,000 as a revolving fund to support putting in some more charging stations. That's just basically it. So you're not disqualified from accessing the revolving fund for, for these, and that I would assume, Un unlike establishing a separate enterprise fund which has different criteria for qualification. No, we can use we can use the revolving fund for this. It's energy efficiency and that's that's basically the point. But the problem is the revolving fund right now, the way the ordinance is written, it can receive money from the sale of renewable energy credits. Right. Stop. Right. So if, so if we spend the money and then the incentives come back, that goes into the general funds and there's no way to get the money back into the right. remote. Right. Um, uh, so that means if you, have a, if you hire a contractor and the contractor buys down the costs and we sign off the incentive to them, then we only pay the, the net cost. Right. So that's what, we'll, that's what we will do. We, we won't use the revolving fund unless we can do it that way. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Okay. How far would the $10,000 go towards getting the chargers? for would that cover it? That's gonna it's yes. Well. Yes. No, that, that should pay for it. Um, okay. the two that we put in um, two that we just put in one cost us the one cost us about nine thousand and that is um, billing for the city electrician's time. And the other one cost us I think about twelve thousand and that had some trenching work and stuff to do. Mm -hmm. um, the one in the garage, since we would be moving two chargers out, and I think the city would cover the cost of moving the chargers to a new location. And wiring to them? And wiring to them. It's mm -hmm. close to a panel. Um, that means there really basically no installation, there's just about no installation costs because the wiring is all ready to the right. existing locations. You just have to hook it up to a new charger. So that, that would be a fairly low cost one. Um, if we then decided to put a second charger in so that we could get the five-year data plan paid for, that may or may not incur a much higher cost. But then th there's the incentives that kick in from National Grid, and it's unclear exactly how much they would cover. It depends on where we put the charger. Uh, it depends on how much trenching is involved. It's, it's kind of a conversation that happens in National Grid. So I can't give you you know, specifics on this at the moment. I, I can say that the 10,000 would definitely cover the cost of, uh, of putting one in by a sizable amount. I think it would be way over the amount of net cost that we would have to pay. Um, to put two in, um, I don't know. It kind of depends on how it all shakes out. But since the mayor approved $10,000 for the revolving funds, to go this way. I thought it would bring it to the commission and if you guys are willing to kind of give it that open-ended of, of you know, $10,000 earmarked for EV chargers, um, uh, then we would spend the money as judiciously as possible and get as many incentives as possible. Um, uh, um, have we made use of the incentives offered by the DEP um, for the charging stations, because of my understanding from the last MMA conferences, you can get up to 80% covered by the state for charging stations, and I wonder if that could kind of balance out some of the costs here. My understanding is that the um, any any money from the DEP that will go to public publicly accessible charging stations is already used up. Um, if that's not used. Workstage chargers, they, they do support, and we have used that in the past. So As got, of August, there's, there are new funds, apparently. Oh, we'll look into that. I'm looking at it now. And it's, oh, great. Yeah, so, and it says for public, for 
for public charging? Yeah, if the, if the website says it, you still have to call and ask. Okay. <laughs> this is updated August 2019. Okay, so. there's hope. Yeah, so I do know that something, they, they had run out of, uh, of money, so I did look at that. Hmm. Um, Does charge point require an app to use it? Uh, yes, uh, so, um, or a card. Or a card, okay, so when yeah. you sign up um, on your desktop to get an account, you can opt to have a card sent for people yeah. who are yes. Luddites. Yes, that's my way. Right. Exactly. Right. Um, how, um, did, how much is the data plan? You know, like a real dollar amount. And, and the second part is, does it cover all the chargers in Northampton, or is it just for the one? Just, just the ones. So it's, um, the data plan is roughly a thousand for five years. Uh, five-year data plan is roughly a thousand dollars per port. So each. Two port charging stations is a little bit over two thousand dollars for five years. So these last two chargers uh, we put in the four ports. Um, National Grid covered uh, effectively covered all of our costs for buying and installing them. It was kind of a one-time incentive that we got hold of, but we had to pay four thousand dollars for the data plans, which is basically the cost we have. My only comment is. Charging stations that are going to be mounted to these terminal locations, just make sure, please make sure they're mounted in a place where they will not get buried with snow. Okay. Do we do okay at James House? James House is fine, but out here, on, <laughs> out here on Crafts Avenue, I've been unfortunately witnessed many times for the cords being completely ripped off. Oh, the once. Charging station. No, okay. it's happened more than once. But well, I would. Oh, really? I haven't heard of it. Yeah. Uh, so those over there are not. They're not in the yeah. most ideal place, but just for long-term maintenance issues. I'll say something else, Rich, um, uh, towards that. Um, when we put the aerial environment ones in, and we had to, the, the only, the, basically the state gave us those, um, and that's what we put in. If you were east of here, including Amherst and east of here, you got charge point stations. Charge point stations very nicely lifted the cords up. So, you know, they don't drag on the ground. You know, we put them back and they, they pull the cords up off the ground. So that would help that situation. Yeah, it would. Yeah. Um, as far as the ten thousand dollars go, are there other things that we could spend that money on? Or, or it sounds like uh, you're asking if we can allocate that money, and part of my being new here. No, you're absolutely but, right. Yeah. Um, what are the other things that 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 money was set up to accomplish? Okay, rough numbers. Let me see if I can. Um, the city. Um, is about to put in LED lighting in seven facilities, um, and we have earmarked a little under two hundred thousand dollars from the I think about one hundred eighty some thousand dollars from the revolving fund for for that. Um, what else do we have earmarked? We have it earmarked for. I wish I could prepare for this. So. If, if you put this $10,000 towards this, I know it's going to leave about $10,000 in the revolving funds on with no earmarks. So you still have about $10,000. And I anticipate bringing in between $40,000 and $50,000 um, by the end of this fiscal year. So we'll be kind of shy that amount. Um, you certainly, I mean, the, the LED upgrades won't be done this year. Uh, the city is going for capital improvement money to finish up the last number of small town, I mean small uh, facilities uh, for the next fiscal year to, to kind of finish up the LED upgrades. Um, uh, but that's like a year out or so. And uh, the revolving fund would be fine money for, for that. And LEDs, they have a high payback. So it's a, you know, it's a nice, nice investment to make. Yeah. Um, uh, but that's kind of farther out, and the fund will be somewhat replenished by then. Um, <laughs> let's put it this way. I don't have anything that I would toss the money at right now, uh, except for what I have on the, the agenda here today, um, um, uh, lined up. So there's nothing competing for it right now. And there'll be more fund, there'll be more money flowing in as we sell more asterisks. Yeah. In the nature of the revolving fund, it's a dedicated pool that receives revenues that don't go into the general fund, they just stay. So 
is seeing that little eddy. Yep. And that's their, for their project specific and anything over a certain threshold requires our, our consent in some way. So. Okay. And, and I will say though that um, the PV array that's feeding the pit went in in 2011, I think. So that means in 2021, we will be getting our last guess rates. And that, that fund will become poor. That sounds like time to build more solar. Maybe. Maybe build more solar. Although, can we do that with third party financing and stuff? Yeah. Um, uh, actually, something else we talked about tonight, we'll, we'll also identify with something we might do. So I'm totally in favor of this and happy to make a motion for it. Uh, and just either now or sometime in the near future, I'd love to advance that conversation about charging for electricity. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm increasingly just worried yeah. about we need to subsidize EV networks, you know, encouraging EV cars. But I'm also worried a lot of the things we're doing out there to lower energy course are really helping middle class and upper middle class and worry about the equity piece. And I, I, so to, I, I don't want to lose people from charging their cars, but I don't want to subsidize more than we need to. I'm not exactly sure where that sweet spot is. Is that something we should put on a future agenda? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing I'm relating to it now is, is there any equipment choice you need to make now to make sure you have that option? Well, that's what we're doing. That's well, the charge point. The charge points allows us to okay. do that. Yeah. Because so yes, we should put the agenda. It's actually one of the reasons I'm kind of going this way myself, is I, I recognize the very, you know, that we have to start charging at some point. It can't become the free mobile no. or Exxon. We, we, I've received feedback, community feedback on yeah. that. Okay, so. And then last related thing, just thinking about Rich's comment, is it, you're talking about you know, swapping stations about in terms of the, the handicapped accessible parking spaces. Is it worth thinking about the one outdoors, making that a charge point and using moving that equipment in the garage where the hose is hanging down is less of a problem? Um, uh, we could. That's an idea. It's, I mean, we really are kind of batting around the ideas that, you know, when our original idea, it, there's all these different factors. So, um, yeah, I, I think I would let Brian at the garage weigh in heavily on this. Um, you know, that's kind of one reason why we're, we're doing this is Brian suggested let's move these guys. Um, but let me yeah, let me bring that up. But you need a formal motion now for that ten thousand? Sure. So moved. Okay. Second. And second. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? No. Okay. Great. <coughs> Thanks. Um, okay. Second. Uh, now another request for the uh, revolving fund. Um, we have a, uh, a proposal to put um, a, a small solar hot water array on the high school. Uh, it actually just fits in this one roof right above the boiler room um, uh, very nicely. Um, and uh, to back up a little bit more, the, the domestic hot water boiler at the high school is in bad shape. It needs to be replaced. Um, uh, instead of just going straight out and replacing it with another gas boiler, um, the idea has been floated to possibly use a solar domestic hot water heat. Now you use solar to provide the heat during the summer when um, that way. Uh, so few other options here. You either replace a gas boiler, or you take heat off the existing boilers for the, the space heating boilers. If you do that, then you have a space heating boiler running during the summer. Because uh, you need to have hot water during the summer. We're trying to avoid turning on that boiler. And we're trying to see whether there's an alternative to a gas, just straight gas boiler. Um, the idea is if you use a solar heat during the summer, you can avoid turning on the big boiler. And you can avoid buying a gas boiler. So that way, you know, you can use the solar hot water. The, um, the large space heat boiler would come on if you have, you know, a long run of cold, cloudy days or something like that. Um, and then actually with Ben's help, kind of identified that you could possibly look at this um, to use the solar hot water uh, as a way to interact, and Ben, you can describe this better than I, but to interact with the existing heating system in order to make the heating system even more efficient. Um, so it kind of becomes a buffer uh, and provides heat that allows the regular heating system to go at a lower, Use rate. Ben, I'm going to let you explain. If you can, you can put it you're just taking, 
whenever there's free solar heat available, and in a high school there are times when you don't have a very large domestic hot water demand, it just is free BTUs for your heating system. So the whole thing is hydronic, and there's heat exchanger between the domestic hot water system and the, the, the hydronic heating loop. And you just take whichever is, wherever there's free heat, you use it, and that allows you to run your boilers at the, the boilers like to run long and efficient, and then not run, as opposed to start and stop. So the large storage capacity of the current hot water heaters becomes a buffer to allow, uh, essentially to function as thermal storage for the whole heating system. That's pretty much all. <laughs> This sounds great, so I'm certainly in favor of it. The only thing is, it seems like we want the revolving fund to be used for things where we can't make the business case otherwise. Okay, this let, is me, what you're presenting. Let, me, let me get to the ask. Okay. okay. So what the ask is, um, uh, so essential services have been kind of stuck on this because we have the plumbers who knew how to do one thing, and we had the solar hot water developer who knew how to do something else but didn't want to touch large, you know, uh, large plumbing jobs. And we didn't have a way to say, how do you blend this all together, making sure that the theory actually will work with these boilers and these hot water systems. We needed an engineer. It took a long time to find one, but we found one. And for $5,000, he, um, he will do a design and a cost analysis of tying the solar in and how to use it as the best use for the solar. And we understand what Ben's aiming for. And, he, and for $1,000, he will do a, um, uh, a quick design and cost use for a gas boiler so that we can compare them. So we're looking for $5,000 to do a comparative analysis between solar and hot water and just sticking a gas boiler in. And once we have that, we then know what we're aiming for. And at that point, you know, we, the, the city has money to replace the, the uh, domestic hot water boiler. That's what we would use. We would use that money to actually implement the system. We're just looking for, and this is one of the best, you know, Gordon, getting back to your, your idea of what best to use for the revolving fund. I've always seen that one of the highest priorities for the revolving fund is paying for these studies that you don't really, wouldn't need if you're just doing business as usual. Because you know, often when you, when you start doing something more efficiently and, and in different ways, you need to have more studies. More engineering. Yeah, we need more engineering. Right. Can I throw one other thing sure. into here, which is, you were saying, oh, we need to install more PV. Well, we have in Massachusetts alternative energy credits for ACE, right. and solar thermal, um, I forget what the multiplier is, but it's high. And so you can now pay those direct credits directly into the revolving fund if you designed it that way. But then that's viable for municipal. Yeah, the, the ACEs are viable. It's just tax incentives. Okay. So we, got, we had that presentation by Spartan that showed the wonderful cost effectiveness and all the rebates right. bundled together as like 12k systems for 2,000. Yeah. And all of that works except for the tax credit. Right. right. So there's a lot of cost effectiveness. So $5,000 for a study, and that's after talking to a few different plumbers who specialize in solar hot water systems. It just seems like a lot of money mm -hmm. for a no, this actually $20,000 isn't, system. This isn't, no, it's not going to be a $20,000 system. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that, was a, that was a home heating system we stuck in. No, I know. Uh, that was a 12,000, but I, I don't know how big yeah. the, the tanks are at that school for. Okay. Yeah, this, I think there's a thousand gallons altogether. So, just so I understand the system that you're suggesting, so it would be a large enough solar hot water array that uh, we could simply have a holding tank that is heated by that hot water and then. The existing tanks. The existing okay, so the existing tanks, and then we wouldn't have a hot water heater, a gas hot water heater at all, and we'd use that heat exchanger off of the hydronic loop from the bigger boilers in case we didn't have enough solar energy. Right, it's just because of the other switch back and forth. You feel like we'll pay for the, the differential and having to fire one of the big boilers every once in a while in the summer. Generally speaking, you'd almost never have to fire that big boiler, and during the right. school year. Sorry. You're firing it anyway, right? Um, and also, at that size, the, the size of the storage, the, the boilers, a single boiler, is actually sized about right to, to run yeah. on. Just and to, to the size of the space that's available for the collectors, you think, is ample for the system. 
it's sufficient to keep those tanks. To keep those tanks. It's, I mean, it's not going to keep the whole school. No, no. It is, <laughs> you know. Right. But it would help. Do you think it's good use of the money? I think I pay for engineer. It's hard for me to know. Like, I, I don't know exactly I would what say it's dirt cheap. Yeah. Uh, just as someone who works in an interchange kind of fund, that's like, like I see this thing cost five thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> the engineers <laughs> are hundred and eighty dollars. I just wonder because uh, if a contractor is going to install and own that contract, some of their it like work should be sizing and inspecting that system. The problem is how they is that through, through procurement we have to know what we're asking for before we go out, mm -hmm. yeah. and we don't know how to ask. We don't know what we're asking. We're at a level of complexity that requires some analysis. Yeah. Right. Right. What so I think is important about doing this is, um, and that makes the five thousand dollars good expenditure, is that hopefully this can be a kind of pilot project for other municipal buildings. Yeah. And so I know that his design will be specific to this particular site, but I think um, if we're able to carry this out, it could be translatable, I think, to other other projects. And so I think we have to do this initial investment so that we can actually kind of, you know, see this as the turning into a flagship kind of project. Yeah, hope, hopefully. I mean, it may turn out it says, hey, put a gas boiler in. <laughs> That's how you find out. But then, and actually, to Elisa's point, I, mean, I think, remember the whole discussion about um, trying to reduce our gas infrastructure and, yep. and Reliance on that, and anything that works towards that objective this turns out to be a home run, part of the sports metaphor, then then, um, then it's a keeper, and then we can start to apply it in other applications. I think it makes, um, and, and since it's dirt cheap, <laughs> and can we ask that they present to us in a way we can understand? Uh, the engineer? Yeah. That I was going to say a presentation about that. Suggest a presentation as well, but I was going to say, like, is there a class being taught on this kind of stuff at Smith Boak, and maybe we could have the engineer go and make a presentation to the class, so we could make it a learning opportunity for the students, and maybe so we could attend it, or, so, it or something like that. So the students present that. Sure. I guess the question is, does that add to the five thousand? Yeah, it probably would. Yeah, probably yeah. would. Right. Exactly. Well, I, <laughs> I certainly mean, would. I could it. certainly talk to yeah. the engineer about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, quite frankly, I think we have someone who's pretty good at teaching this kind of thing, right? Fresh <laughs> here. <laughs> so, you know, so if, uh, you would you would thoroughly understand what's what okay. the engineer says, and if you want someone to teach, I would only suggest. Okay, so we're assigning Ben to give. Right. Us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> great. That's <laughs> <laughs> Smith won't mind if you ask Professor coming in. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that if, if we do follow through with, on the project, it seems like we should sort of formally say that there that there'd be like a written case study that comes out of it or some way of really like documenting and creating the institutional knowledge to actually replicate this. Yeah. You know who I would want to do that written case study? Is a high school student. Or how about GCC program? We have a little uh, green energy. Yeah. Of course, in education. And probably somebody up there that would be jump on the chance. Yeah. But That's an idea. Yeah. Yes, this might be too far afield of a question, but do you have a sense of what the condition, you know, how much life is left in boilers across the city? I mean, how soon might we need to actually convert some of these to solar thermal? Well, we won't be converting boilers. I mean, this is a domestic hot water. Yeah, so, you know, large boilers. Um, uh, right now, the city is about to go into its capital improvement planning. Um, and that's what we're looking at. Um, and actually, um, as we get down to another one of the topics on tonight's agenda, this, will, this could come back up again. Should I bring it up now? Um, no, I'll wait until we get to another one. So I'll, if I forget, remind me to go back to that. So let me just say that it might be useful, depending on where we are in that need for new systems, to um, think maybe a little bit more broadly and have this engineer take a look. You know, it might cost less now to have him look more holistically, not just at the high school. Yep. You know, for a couple extra thousand dollars. So that's that's why I was thinking, kind of trying to think ahead in terms of other systems in the city. You must have read the policy statement, though. We're talking about the 
holistic <laughs> examination of the city's energy infrastructure will run into millions of dollars. No, to do a true study, to actually engineer it out. Okay, it's probably going to run about Well, I think there are certain things we can do internally to kind of triage what might need to be address and have that come be part of it for, you know, negotiate some kind of package deal as it were is all I'm suggesting. I'm not saying that we're, that we're looking for like some big, yeah. massive. Yeah. There are a lot of free resources, including the energy extension right. at UMass, to do enough of the engineering to pick the projects that require the deeper dive mm -hmm. and therefore not have to pay for the engineers to do every single detail. Um, so somewhere in between, <laughs> and, and, and we've got these other resources. Okay, great. Yes, Smith, Smith was a solid engineering department. This is something that would be super interested to do, right? So it kind of behooves us to create some kind of plan of synergy between these different resources mm -hmm. so that we can kind of maximal, maximize the, the, you know, the amount that we're going to pay for this engineer ultimately. <laughs> I, I guess on that topic, I realize this is a bit of field, but you now have two fairly detailed studies from the Clean Energy Corps yes. on, on yeah. two buildings, one of them right here, um, a reasonable uh, kind of quicker analysis of Jackson Street, so that's three. It, you know, it may be that basically you know, we just say Clean Energy Corps, you're going to think about Northampton and Northampton only next spring. Sounds good to me. And we get that kind of deep dive, at least into the schools, which happen to be the biggest energy resources. Um, and then we look around for these other resources, for these other buildings that need enough of a examination to identify, you know, boilers that are get closing in to being able to, you know, kind of finding our, our punch list of things that then go to uh, an engineer to actually spec. So um, you need a motion. Yeah. So I move that we approve the funding for uh, preliminary design for, for this project. Put solar hot water. Put solar hot water. Okay. Solar hot water with high school. Um, wait a second. Any further discussion? I guess I'd like to create some kind of amendment here that says that we do this, but that we also do some kind of internal <coughs> investigation of what, um, kind of how to proceed more holistically. Because so, I think doing that, approving this money without kind of doing that bigger piece is a little bit of a misstep. Well, so we have these are, so we're approving the use of a revolving fund. We don't really, we don't attach um, vision statements, basically, which I think is what this would be in some sort. But I don't think it's inappropriate to suggest, actually, as policy, but we could even make, we could make a, so instead of an amendment on this, I think of a policy recommendation that should be embedded in, in, in the mayor's office and in, in Chris's office as opposed to, because this is a, just be a tailing that would disappear. Because it's not a, if it doesn't happen, then the money isn't approved type of thing. You know what I'm saying? That, that. that makes sense. First of all, I don't think it's a vision statement. I think it's actually a very practical suggestion. But um, I just don't want it to get lost in the, you know, I, I if would, we don't somehow embed it so in, in I, the I would just say that if, if, we don't, if we don't touch all this by the end of the meeting, Bring it back up again for the next agenda, but we will. We'll touch on this by the end of the meeting on another agenda item. Really, exactly what you're talking about. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Where did that start? Oh, no. yeah. oh, please. Oh, no, I was just going to say that um, that a study of a specific system in a specific place is, is very much not uh, a look at an entirety of our infrastructure and uh, the things that we learn about the ability to do solar thermal hot water uh, at the high school with that system will be potentially applicable elsewhere, 
but we're talking about solar domestic hot water, which is an isolated system and not necessarily applicable to our all, all the other systems we have in place. Um, it might be applicable to other hot water systems that we have. Uh, and I think the idea of the heat exchanger between the domestic hot water loop and the heating loop, the hydronic heating loop, is actually a great idea. Um, so, and, and that certainly has lots of applications. I think we are going to learn a lot that we can apply even without having to, to say it. Any further discussion? Could, nope. could you state the motion again so I can get it in? The motion is to approve funding for the preliminary design for solar hot water. Guys, going to high school. Go high school. That's the design, it's not a feasibility. <coughs> design, yeah, I'm sorry. And, you know, on the issue of the amendment, that because it would be a qualifier, if we added it as an amendment, but only the funding would only qualify, provided that there is a, a you know, holistic study. I don't know, I, I, that's the thing that makes me nervous, so. Yeah, I, I'm going to ask if you could hold off and yeah, yeah. we could revisit it again if, I, if yeah. I'm wrong. But yeah. I think you'll be I, satisfied by the yes. end of the meeting. Yes. Okay. Bill, what I got down was to approve funding to preliminary design for solar hot water for high school. Is that? I think that, the, that covers it, right? Did the engineer give us a design percentage? Is it like 30% design? Yeah, he didn't describe it that way. Is that something we would find to pull? Like, you would, you, you, we'd better find out exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because what I got, it, so I met him at the high school, and we, we kind of like talked it through. It seemed to me like he was going to come up with a set of specs that you could yeah. hand over to a contractor, and they would execute. Yeah, I think actually that might be the case. Cool. But, you know, I'd ha I have to remember, but I was going to say, even if it's just a preliminary design, I mean, it's a simple enough system that a preliminary design is just about a finished design, because what he's what he's going to do is he's going to make sure that the Beesman boiler can do what you want it to do. And then the heat exchanger can do what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so by the time he's done that, it's just a kind of a line drawing of your plumbing system and you're done. So, you know, it's, um, it won't take much for him. There's not a big difference between a preliminary design and a finished design. Can't, can't so, throw I'll, I'll leave that to an <laughs> <laughs> executive summary. So, I, I would say just, just as a quick, quick aside, the um, high school uh, environmental club had been asking me if we could put more solar in the high school yeah. right before we started talking about this, and I got back to them and said we might be putting some high school, we, we might be putting some solar thermal in the high school. So the idea of who, somebody giving a presentation or writing a case study, I think it'd be great to have a high school student do it. Yeah. You know, they wanted it on their building, we can do it. Maybe they could work with a G, someone from GCC as an educational piece and have the high school student, you know, that's, I'll keep that in, in, you know, try to get that done as well, but uh, instead teacher, of asking the engineer. Is there a teacher at the high school who kind of like heads that up that could direct something like that? Yeah, there's someone involved with the environmental club, I'm not sure who he is, or who she is. Are we ready for a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, very good, thanks. Uh, community choice aggregation. Um, Wayne, do you want to take this one? Sure. I think we've talked about community choice aggregation, not beyond the, the basics that's here. So, you know, we're working on this task force with Amherst and Pelham. We're supposed to sort of get close to making recommendations by the end of the year. Um, we still have lots of unknowns in terms of we're doing CCA2, which is sort of leading edge, we're doing CCA3. What's the right geography? Can we work across? Uh, investor on utility lines. But I think we're sort of far enough along that we want to do a CCA at some point. And we know, you know, sort of the, the Greenfield Hadley really low hanging fruit approach and some limited benefits. We think everything we do can go above that. And so I think we're ready to go to city council and ask for approval for authority on CCA, knowing lots of details have to have, have to follow. What are, one of the things that convinced me is worth going ahead is the consultants are pretty clear. You don't want the detailed authority from council to be too specific because almost certainly you get in trouble later and Department of Public Utilities is sort of a look at that language. So we want pretty broad language. We want to say we do this by ourselves, that's what we have to do it. We do it with other people, we can work together. So it's sort of said in the case, you know, council voted on this however many years ago. Uh, 
uh, seven years ago with Hampshire County. That didn't go anywhere, but so we cite that as sort of the background. Um, so the wares clause are really set in state without getting us in trouble when we go through the regulatory piece. And the final paragraph basically authorizes the administration to move forward in whatever flavor makes sense later. Is this going to have any impact on the council of governments? Changes to the council of governments? Well, I mean, council of governments is gone. Um, Todd would love the city to commit and hire them. Um, but I think, you know, no, it doesn't have any impact on, you know, whether the city has staff, whether the city does it by a broker agreement, or the city contracts with somebody, those are all later decisions we made. You know, so it leaves all the options open to the table. I, mean, I think in terms of the subcommittee that's working on it, the committee that's working on it, the committee probably has strong feelings in terms of, but no, this doesn't limit us. Anymore. And did everybody have a chance, I mean, you, you, you got, you got emailed out to the agenda. Yeah, so. Yeah, just only one minor word change that came from one person reviewing it, which is the last version got that said competitive electric supplies. This is the last wares clause. And the final version I have is a dual priorities procurement of maintaining competitive electric rates and maximizing greenhouse gas emissions. So we're deliberately not saying we want, you know, 80% of the savings to go to greenhouse gas, 100%, because again, we don't want to sneak that before DPU and then be sunk. But we are, you know, so the competitive rates is what we need to be. If we charge more, we lose customers. If we charge less, we encourage people to consume more and we leave money on the table. So we want to be competitive. It doesn't mean we're going to be exact parity when the rates is not going to fluctuate here. But I'll always allow you to say that. Any comments? Well, I have a question. Um, just because I, 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 I don't actually know what the number of people in Northampton is, but I, I know a number of people who have signed on to community solar agreements that interact with National Grid. Does that affect them? Because these are like these 20 year commitments that they make. So no, we become, we would become the, I mean, first people can opt out at any point. Right. It's a positive opt out, so it doesn't happen automatically. Um, for small users, homeowners, small businesses, it's typically people opting out as in single digits. Larger users, you know, Comora to the city, lots of larger users have already opt out and we're probably not going to attract them back. My understanding is no, it shouldn't, we have to get a step or not, that's the way I don't know. Do we have to, you know, affirmatively say the same with us? I don't know if that's right or not. If, um, but it, but it's, um, it's aimed only at the supply portion of the bill. So, you know, they, the National Grid buys supply, passes it through. Right. And then anything to do with solar is kind of like outside the perimeters of that. It's not really you're not you're not buying solar from that PV array. Well, but this is what about virtual net metering, right? So yeah, that's the, that's that's money. That's not electricity. That's okay. saying I have a you know I have a net I have a, a net, I have a coupon I can't spend. I'm going to give it to you at a reduced cost, and you get to spend it on electricity. So that's outside of this. So this is actually dealing with just the rates of the electricity going through. So it would be separate. Yeah. But just because I'm having a really hard time processing exactly this, can you give me like a kind of like the 10,000 foot view on what we're trying to accomplish here? Who's yeah. going to own the systems? Who's going to own the land that the systems are installed on? How are we dealing with interconnections? All that. So stuff. the CCA 1.0 model was basically just buying racks. So you, you buy solar racks and, and people actually do arbitrage sometimes. You, you buy windmill racks, right, renewable energy credits from Montana because they're really cheap and you can brag about how you're doing renewable energy, but you're not adding to the supply. They're actually, actually, wait, let me do that. That's wait, let me step back even one step further. What the Community Charge Aggregation is doing is that we, right now National Grid buys electricity supply and passes it through. And you can go out and you can buy your supply from someone else on the open market right now. Uh, but you get a bad price because you're just one individual person. Green Trans Aggregation lets the community aggregate all of your community and go out and buy electricity for them. It's kind of the new green thing. It's just buying electricity. Now the community can also, now what Wayne's getting to is the way the community can also say, well, I'm going to buy a certain amount of recs to go with that. And now my green, now my electricity is a little greener. Is that a one point or a two point? 
Yeah. Well, everyone right. debates. Let me go actually, I mean, Chris are going back. Until 20 or 30 years ago, in all states, not utility, investor owned utilities were total monopolies on both supply and energy. And then some states said, how do we create competition? The supply side isn't a natural monopoly. Distribution is fully a natural monopoly. And, and only I think eight states now allow competition. And one of the ways they encourage competition is exactly what Chris said. The municipality can become a default supplier. And how we get that electricity can be any one of lots of different measures. So that's when you get into these numbers of, so you would be getting away from this one, two, three, it's a continuum. But the least continuum is, they just go out and buy the worst power that's out there and save their repairs money. Right? It doesn't matter what they buy. They might save some money. But, um, it doesn't have to be any green benefits at all. Then the easiest green benefits are just buying renewable energy. Right? So I'm putting a windmill up in Montana. It makes sense financially. I don't care about greenhouse gases. And I'm selling the, the wrecks to somebody else. But because it made sense financially anyway, I'm just getting more profit to the guy who's putting up the wind generator. And so I'm not really adding to the alternatives, right? It makes sense in the middle of Montana or Iowa or Texas to have wind generators anyway. Um, so that, that lowest level is you're buying reps from somewhere else. The next level is, again, these aren't ones, two, zero, but you might be buying reps locally. What most people do on this, and almost everybody outside of, of California, are buying short-term contracts. Uh, the benefit for short-term contracts is there's the least risk from those balance, right? You can, yeah, I know it's going to happen in the next year, and it's going to happen in the next two years. It might be harder to do a longer term. If you really want to move towards the next stage of additive, getting people to put renewable energy supplies they wouldn't otherwise, you need to start being willing to do long-term contracts. Mm -hmm. That becomes more expensive and more risky, um, and so people are in this continuum between doing this. So, you know, that, um, Cambridge is don't you long term I apologize I just want to think, don't wouldn't the long term contracts actually be safer because with renewables there's no increased cost on an annual basis they usually lock in Yes, but your customer rate. base isn't secure. That's the problem. The longer term you can get cheaper rates, that's the benefit yeah. for doing it. And you can incentivize yes, people long -term. but your customer could quit at any point. So what happens if you if you sign a 20 year municipality signs a 20 year contract and your customers every day can flee? Um, because we're being out competed potentially. Why would someone could be? Yeah. yeah, the world changes. You make a mistake. Okay. And so that's the, what's the right balance? I mean, you know, it's all going to be balanced. Like some kind of a risk matrix, and we do kind of a combination of them, just like you would buy stocks or whatever. Okay. Um, quick comment. I just want to note that we're considering this at this level in the city because of one person who's here, Del Frank, <laughs> and um, Sam Teitelman, who actually brought this to the city council and we kind of moved it forward. So I just want to acknowledge Adele, who's sitting yeah. here, that we're really considering this because of your work together with Sam. And I'm just wondering if you have anything. I just want to kind of recognize you and ask if you have anything to add to this you know, where we're at with this now. Well, I don't see any downside to approving an authorization because it leaves all the options on the table. And there's very careful consideration being given to um, exactly how this would proceed. So uh, I don't see any downside for, the, for this group um, to approve moving forward in this exploration. And I just wanted to ask really quickly, the whereas that um, refers to the, the previous relationship with um, HCOT or the, yeah. is that there just for historical purposes? Yes. What is it? Just historical purposes. Yeah. You know, and we can cross it out. I don't care. Yeah. It, it was really, the, it was mostly a statement about we've been talking about for seven years. Right. It's yeah. a show of commitment to, to, to the notion and idea of aggregation. Yeah. But if you want to drop it, it's a total time. Of course, it was the DPU that crushed Right. The, the H cog. Yeah, right. I, mean, no, so, yeah. I don't know. There may be. Because they're not in existence anymore. What's the. And also, we, yeah. just, we didn't end up having that formal relationship with right, them. Right. So it just feels a little bit odd to me. I mean, I understand having it there for historical purposes. I guess, they grew an sure aggregator or whatever their, their role was. Yeah, you know, there's, no, there's no benefit in terms of DPU. So if there's a, you want to drop it, that's fine. We could also just do since October 12, 2000. 
and 12, the city council has been committed to moving forward in the CCA. Is that the better way to do it? Yes. I mean, that's basically two different, three different city councils that essentially signed off on this over the course of the history. So. And if we're talking historical, too, I'd love to see something like in with input from citizens. I mean, because I really think it's important to acknowledge the fact that this got reinvigorated yep. because of, you know, Adele and Right, Sam. so I use that same paragraph. Yeah. yeah. Just put Adele instead of... <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to say, coming from you, though, I never use the word citizens anymore. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I actually just talked about that today. I always say residents. I don't yeah. know how that came up. Because not everyone who lives in Northampton is a citizen. We need to acknowledge our immigrant and refugee population and all the people that live in the city. And I guess I schooled you at some point. Uh, actually, they technically count as citizens. They all count as citizens. You're a sentient being walked. I'm just not going to use the word. Okay. All right. So I'll I change that one character. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is an appeal to the DPU, so let's, That's right, yeah. so let's, let's consider them and their vagaries. Um, but I, I would actually forward this as a motion for approval to send forward to the council with a positive recommendation. There we go. Second. Second. Okay, would you um, I, I, Okay, the motion is to send this forward with a positive recommendation. to the city council for consideration. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Chris, I have one question. Sure. So, the mayor supports that my office does, this committee does. I had central services in the draft. Do you know if that's okay with David? Oh, hang on. Um, yeah, he's not here tonight, is he? Sure. No, sorry. I'll so, I Say it again. Oh, wait. So is that uh, right? The current language of Hunter recommendation is mayor planning sustainability, central services, and energy sustainability. I just don't want to make assumptions for David. I can't say. Okay. Um, I mean, I can say for myself, but I can't yeah, say yeah. for him. And unfortunately, he's not here. Um, if you want to throw in two counselors, I bet I know where you can find them. <laughs> well, council is voting, so I, we tended not to insist Well, that council change. does. Right. We well, well that's right. I mean, this is a. a an executive directive, but it's not unusual. I mean, you can have council sign on as well, too. But only if you're trying to pad it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll have great influence with our people. Right. Yes, we hold great sway. Yes, you guys can do the presentation. They just sit there in awe every so, time we speak. Uh, yes. Just going to submit this tomorrow. Should I drop central service and stay it in tomorrow? We did tomorrow. Okay. Well, we're going to call. Yeah. Okay. Or you could ask them, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry, that's my. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Um. Okay, so uh, now, uh, Alisa, we get to what you were talking about. <laughs> um, and this is basically, okay, so, you know, the mayor has um, committed the city to becoming a net zero community by 2050. Um, as the city moves forward on its, its standard um, maintenance procedures and uh, you know, making sure things are in place, I started realizing that you were starting to put in systems that are going to be there for 30 or 40 years that kind of locks us into using fossil fuels for that long. Um, brought this up with the mayor, um, uh, and the mayor uh, basically said, well, write me a policy. And um, he said, um, and, you know, what do we do about this? And so I've written the policy. Um, ben has had some input into this very nicely. Um, one of the key parts of this policy, uh, if you get to the, you know, it was sent out to everybody, so you should have a chance to see it, but um, if you get to the procedures and responsibilities, I'll just read the very beginning paragraph there. It says, over the next three years, central services shall develop for each city and school building that uses more than 400 MMBTU of natural gas, oil, or propane a year. A plan to replace the existing HVAC systems with alternative low carbon systems with the preferred outcome of being the elimination of on-site fossil fuel combustion 
and the elimination of low efficiency standalone heating and AC appliances. So the, the meat of this is to, in the long run, put together a plan for every single large building, every single large school or, or city building, on how do we basically start to shift it off of fossil fuels. Um, that's, I think, at least is what you were just, what you were getting at. Um, so this is a policy that basically says to do that. And then there's a whole bunch of um, uh, guiding points on how that should be done, um, uh, which is where Ben actually had a lot of input into here. Um, it does say for essential services to establish an advisory group. It's left very open-ended on exactly how they do that, but um, uh, it could just be a few folks that they refer to. Um, and I'm not sure what else to say without actually reading this in depth. Uh, well, let me, I'll go over the purpose. The purpose of the mayoral policy is to establish a greenhouse gas emission evaluation procedure for all municipal heating, ventilation, and air conditioning improvement projects to ensure that these types of city investments are consistent with and contribute to the city of Northampton's pledge to become a net zero community by 2050, the city's support for the climate change mitigation goals enshrined in the Paris Agreement, the city's commitment to the global covenant of mayors for climate and energy, and Northampton City Council's resolutions in support of 100% renewable energy and opposing the expansion of gas infrastructure. Um, the scope of it is, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just read this piece too. The mayoral policy applies to procurement and installation of all heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems and appliances, including heating systems for domestic hot water and standalone heating and cooling appliances. This policy pertains to municipal and school facilities, including Northampton Public School and Smith Vocational Agricultural High School buildings. The policy says it does not pertain to equipment replacement needed for maintenance and ongoing operation of existing HVAC systems. So that's kind of the, the general piece of it. And then the, the overall policy statement is the process to procure, replace, or add any heating, ventilation, or air conditioning system or appliance shall identify and use the lowest life cycle cost solution that prices in a cost of greenhouse gas emissions produced by that system or appliance over its lifetime. Whenever possible, the selection will be made within the context of a long-term capital improvement plan to convert the facility in which the equipment will be employed to a net zero building. So the policy is to say that just to do this whenever you're replacing an HVAC system, preferably to do it within the context of a large plan so you, you're doing it organized over time. But even if, for instance, right now, uh, the high school domestic hot water system, if this policy had been promulgated by the mayor, we would almost be required to look at solar hot water. And we would, and we would have to take into account the fact that there's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we have to actually put a price on that. Um, so it's, it's basically, we wouldn't even look at it and say, what's the cost difference? You would say, what's the cost difference and what's the cost difference taken into account the fact that one of them is going to produce more greenhouse gases than the other. So that's the mayoral policy. So it's written for the mayor. It's going to be a mayor, mayoral policy. Um, I asked the mayor if it was, if we uh, would be okay with just passing this by the Energy Commission because you guys are all intelligent, informed folks. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not asking for any kind of vote here. I'm asking for feedback. If there's any tweaks that should be made, comments, um, before I send it back to the mayor, and then he will make the final call on, um, on actually putting this work. Uh, how many buildings does that include for under that All right, no, actually, I, I made a mistake here. When I actually, I knew someone was gonna ask that. <laughs> so I compiled this list, and I forgot that I actually included electricity in this, because that does say MMBTU from heating fuels. So, um, so this list might be a little bit inaccurate, but I think, <coughs> I, I don't think it, I think this is it. Okay, it's gonna be all the schools. That's, that's easy. And it all schools that the city owns, because there's Why a lot of schools that are. do all the buildings that the city owns, and we need to do this for everything. Well, some of them, some of them just get to be really small. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the maintenance shop for, for one of the cemeteries, you know, got a little propane here or something in there. You know. <laughs> well, when it goes, we should put it in the basement. Yes, you should. Yes, right. Um, uh, I, mean, I think that's a reasonable uh, the, yeah, thought. It's just reasonable. why well, I think, cut it off. No, no, no. Um, it's, it's, you're not cutting. You're not cutting it off. Um, 
because the policy applies to everything. The uh, over the next three years, central services shall develop uh, a city plan. Okay. Yeah, that's right. right. So you're setting, okay. you're setting a plan for certain. Gotcha. Right? Okay. That's totally yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So needing a plan would be each one of the schools, uh, police headquarters, uh, fire department, and, and I think the Florence Fire Station would be in there as well. Um, uh, it certainly is if you include electric, but I'm not positive about that. Um, I did size that 400 to really to kind of catch the buildings that really made sense to me, so I think Forest Fire should have been in there. DPW, wastewater treatment plant, water treatment plant, um, the DPW garage, ironically, the DPW admin, probably don't need it, this is a kind of little admin building. Um, and then as far as city buildings go, City Hall, Memorial Hall, um, uh, Pachowski, this, this building right here, Senior Center, um, uh, and I believe Academy of Music could be covered under that as well. So that kind of, and then Smith Vocational, it's any one of their large buildings, A, B, C, D, and E, um, would, would hit that, um, I believe. Uh, e might not hit that, but both definitely A, B, C, D, the, 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 the four primary buildings would be. How come you said yeah. city well, and school building? Because you're not including non-city school buildings. School. Uh, no, we're not, because we don't have control of that. Right. So this why not just say city mm -hmm. and street buildings? I mean, that, that includes schools. Yeah, right? it's, it's to be clear. Yeah, but in, in, inside the government, we think of there's a city side, there's a school side. And Smith Volk has got his own board of trustees. They're actually a separate entity out there. So it's really good just to specify. We're talking about city buildings, school buildings, and the vocational. Okay. Yeah. Actually? I know I had submitted some comments to you. You did. Um, yeah, I read it closely before our last meeting, but then it didn't happen. Um, but, but my concern was around sort of how we were defining life cycle costs okay. and whether we were talking about you know a financial, economic life cycle or environmental life cycle. And yeah, how we're defining what that carbon price yeah. is, because I think the price of carbon and whether we're looking at environmental or economic life cycle costs can really influence how much cheap this policy is. Right, has. right. So there's a conundrum there um, in that if you, and, and I actually kind of fought with it when I was writing this, is that if we put a price of carbon in here, I mean, that's one thing you could do, you could write a price of carbon in here. Um, uh, you know, from the mayor's point of view, he needs to have a certain level of trust in his, in his staff. And, you know, actually putting a price in there is, is could be seen as micromanaging. Um, whereas, and, and he's also not the expert. Um, uh, and situations might change over time. So the idea that you have to put a price of carbon on there and then trusting your staff to go about how you do that, um, there's a you know, it's not like this is going to just magically make everything be perfect. It's moving us in the right direction. Um, but leaving that up to central services and the advisors that they so choose to work with to come up with something that works for the city. Um, and you're right. You, I mean, you could set a high price of carbon and you'll never put in another gas system. Ever. It doesn't matter what. You'll never put it on a gas system. You know, but that may not actually be the most practical thing. Can you point to a pure, like respected place that has an appropriate price? I think that's um, uh, according well, to some standard. Or yeah, there, there certainly are different ones out there. I mean, there's like the Chicago Carbon Exchange. You know, what are they pricing carbon at? Um, Wrong, so that's market the model driven. based on like a sample yeah. system to see what it does based upon the uh, equation that you're asking somebody to write. Well, it's, if, if you're making carbon prices, you're either saying I'm going to create a market and I'm going to see what what shakes out as a price. But since we're not actually participating in a market, right. this is just a purely accounting internal accounting device. You actually need to pick a cost of carbon that reflects somehow what you think the actual value of carbon is. So uh, the Obama administration spent a whole lot of time creating the social cost of carbon, where they were trying to actually look at the ecosystem services that are being removed when we emit carbon and it affects climate change. Essentially, that was 
their way of trying to do the accounting, it was a pretty high number. I think it was something like $100 a ton of, yeah. of um, So, you know, but, but there's lots of academic literature out there. In a sense, all you do is have to pick a number that everybody in the city can agree on. Maybe it makes sense to add to this something like a process by which you find your carbon price. I would be concerned that in the future, if a carbon market is created and the price crashes, and then they take that low price, and, and then it all of a sudden kind of diffuses what we're trying to accomplish, which is move things. But well, that's all of a sudden money. That's all of a sudden goes into your your cost of operations because now there's a carbon market. There's a carbon price out there imposed by government. Well, we now have the confluence of the pragmatism of what you're discussing and then the political reality of what this is. This is a policy. Yeah. This is for this mayor in this time at this moment. Right. Um, you would get another mayor who decides, uh, witness the executive at the federal level, who just simply said, who just sort of says, okay, that's we're changing all that. Right. So to have the minutiae that you're describing here embedded in this, in the mayoral policy, uh, in some respects, might be a bridge too far as far as I think I'm just guessing from the mayor's perspective that I think that's a type of uh, the, the mayor wants I mean because essentially he's we don't approve this he's going to approve this okay. and he's going to it will be his policy going forward I don't see any harm in suggesting that he consider some kind of uh, matrix of, by which uh, you know how we do assessment when we're trying to consider you know cost-benefit evaluation of these. But at the same time, I, I actually think the structure and form of this is probably something that he would be amenable to as it stands now. But anything else, any other recommendations like that wouldn't hurt. But again, as I said, it's, we don't, it's not a law. We don't work. It's, it's, it's simply an executive policy. And, and, I, and, I, and I will say, if, if it takes time to put together that kind of a you know, process that you would do, that would take time. The city's installing infrastructure right now, right. and there's actually been, a, if this had gone in place last year, then I, I know one project we did this last year that would have come out different. It, would have been, it probably would have been done differently. And so, um, you know, I, I feel that the, the, the mayor's made his commitments, and, you know, the guidance that I've provided him is that if you want to meet that, you need to have a policy that actually directs people to do it that way. You know, you have to start to make decisions aimed at reducing getting to net zero by 2050. And um, I think this, I think this would do it myself. Uh, but I, I will pass that up to him. That you know, that you know, the idea of if he wants to to look at you know how involved does he want to be, quite frankly, in setting what the greenhouse gas emission cost is. How do you take that cost into effect? But what the process is to decide that. And in my mind. You know, the cost isn't so much what the environmental cost is. It's like, what is the cost that would actually get us to net zero by 2050? The social cost. No, what is the cost that would drive the city's economic decisions right. to get us to, a, to net zero, but, you know, aim us towards net zero by 2050? But if we slotted in the social cost of carbon, that would always... Maybe or maybe not. It might be underpriced. That, so there's, in, in the world of carbon pricing, then, there's the other question, which is, what is the price elasticity of whatever the, the fuel that you're trying to get rid of is to actually motivate behavior, in which case you sometimes have to have a much higher price to get beyond that, you know, get, you know, get behavior. But in this case, it's really just an internal accounting. That's a really important point, though, because as the demand for fossil fuel drops, as we're making these technological advances, <laughs> The, the, the result is that there's going to be less demand for fossil fuel and the price is going to crash. And my concern with putting a calculation into this policy is that there are factors that we just don't have any control over. And if somebody is sitting in an engineering office going, well, what's the cheapest thing? And we can tell them to put in inputs, but without any control over those inputs, then the calculation come out, could come out in a way that we don't want it to. I, I, I will pa pass yeah. this as, as I was just saying that 
you know, I think we could give her more teeth by yeah. defining more of a process and a bias toward environmental costs as opposed to economic costs. My but point I, I get it. We have a calculation at all. Why don't we just say yeah, yeah. that it has to be right. a system that can be net zero and there is no gas system that can be net zero? I think what, what I can do is I can, I can explain, you know, if I pass this up to the mayor, what I, what I can say is the feedback that came from the Energy Commission includes the fact that there is a, a balance between teeth and um, and making this too rigid. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> the mayor actually, there was a committee that considered all um, capital projects and they make recommendations to the mayor. The mayor then went down essentially drafts a budget. The budget is, is virtually a moral document. It, it, it expresses our priorities as a community. And I think, to your point, that those, if those morals, those scruples are embedded, then that automatically fits into the calculus. It's not, um, we're not going for the cheapest necessarily. We don't. Uh, we, we make decisions based on what has the best, the, the best social outcome and the social investment hopefully as well. So it, 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 so I don't think it hurts to make these recommendations to the mayor, but at the same time the mayor may not embed it in the policy, but it's actually embedded in the ethos such as it is. Yeah, it's, it's, it depends, it's going to depend a lot on the culture of right. just the working, you know, if there's some things you just can't put down on paper, it has to be the culture of the, your, your workforce. So that's another question I have then. So I heard a loophole. And so I guess the kind of the question is, was that, is anybody actually looking for loopholes? If they are, then I heard one. If they're not, then it doesn't matter. It was this whole, this policy does not apply to maintenance or something like that. Maintenance of systems, well, parts for applying, replacing a system, well, for instance, we've got a giant steam system and I need to replace the steam boiler. <laughs> No, it's but it's just a part on a system. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and you know, so the question is like, what's the mentality of the people applying the policy? Yeah, right. The mentality of, I mean, the direction there. I mean, the way I would read that, and I would certainly hope the way all staff would read that. So I have to replace a belt, replace a belt. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, you don't have to cost price out of belts or something like that. It's, you know, it's, it's to that extent. And, I, and uh, Bill, I'm glad you mentioned the capital improvements process. The mayor also did say that knowing that this policy would include coming up with these long-term plans, um, uh, is that he, and he, even though knowing that those engineering studies might be somewhat expensive, you know, the mayor's idea was over a number of years, you do a couple of them, a couple of years, this is nothing. You know, do the plans. So you do it and put them into the capital improvement process. So those. Plans will now be going through the capital improvement process. They, they will be balanced against, you know, a new printer. <laughs> what is more important? Chris, I should go back to Ben's comments. So, just one specific language might be that sentence to insert the word non capital. So, we define capital improvements as things that expect a life of five years or more and cost over $10,000. Yes, right. So, that's it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, uh, this policy should not apply to non capital equipment. Okay, instead of, okay, just that, okay. One thing I would also say is that when, uh, because of the evolution of technology in this arena, that, um, that when we make these plans, we have to make sure that they don't get like cemented in 2020, because when that boiler breaks in 2026, we don't want to come in with 2020 technology. So we, there has to be some kind of a mechanism to review to ensure that that actually is the appropriate that's, best. That's it would that in capital improvement. Capital improvement plans are five-year projections, mm -hmm. and they're adaptable and changeable by the time they become they become realized or authorized. So, so okay. yeah, that's all embedded. Well, thank you guys. That's good. Yeah, I think it was a good discussion. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, Lisa, does it get to you know, the point that you were trying to work with the? It does really broadly, but I again think that you know looking at that specific scenario at the high school is a way to start being practical about how we 
are looking forward. Right. I, I see the high school as kind of an example of what this is going to drive. Yeah. As long as it's done with that forward looking, yeah. forward planning. That's, that's, that's the idea. Yeah. Well, there's definitely stuff in this plant here, which we'll have this have out. Um, which is what we're going to do. It talks about. <laughs> Uh, needing to use things like this as educational oh opportunities. Uh, oh so man! Oh man! I didn't watch. I wasn't watching the time. We got five yeah, minutes left. We did way too long. Should have covered the whole plan. <laughs> <laughs> and that was supposed to be the big ticket item for tonight. <laughs> first item on the next agenda. Actually, what is the next? Agenda? Sure. Uh, first item on the next agenda. What's the time frame on? Where are we in the month? <laughs> yeah. What? So there's no legal yeah. time frame. Um, it would be nice to do it before this city council leaves because somebody would be so involved with the process. Which is when? Uh, the, yeah. She's counting the days. So it's not critical. <laughs> you know, we have a council that's been very involved in this discussion. It's not going to be here at the council. So if we can make it the end of the year, I'd like to. And if we can't, then we can't. By the end of the year, that's three. December 31st. That's pretty good. That could be reasonable. So the right. promise is two council meetings. I mean, can I just spend sort of the five minutes yeah, on it? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing, I mean, I, you know, I liked all the comments we, we got from everyone today. I think one thing important is this is about sort of creating big frameworks. And so I'll give a couple examples why we're not going to go to, uh, sort of a few reasons why we're not going to go too deep into the weeds. First, you know, we now have 11 years, almost 12 years experience with sustainable energy. And Bill cites it more often than almost anybody else, um, including some really controversial things in council. But he never cites, and this is a good thing, mm -hmm. he never cites the detailed action plan that's there. And I would say almost never everybody reads the detailed action plans. He cites what's the vision, what's the framework, what are we trying to do. And when we're dealing with the plan long term, that's important. So actually, just think about the policy you've just been talking about, the same thing. This isn't saying what we're doing to all the boilers. This is saying we need to create a plan to deal with those boilers. And so think of this plan as being a similar thing. We need a lot more steps to go forward. So to me, the bigger thing, rather than say a detailed match of exactly what we're doing, is it's the framework. So one really big thing here is creating a carbon budget. I don't think, I know I couldn't do, I don't think Chris could do, a detailed roadmap to 2050 and all the things we need to do. What we start saying is, Louis there has to make a decision, is he buying a new gas vehicle or is he buying something different? I don't know decisions he makes. Yes. <laughs> but, but to some extent, well, use public works as an example. To some extent, public works could be switching from diesel to electric bulldozers. Or they could be doing more energy efficient buildings. They could be doing 20 different things. We should be giving them a carbon budget which says here's what your your fuel here's what your total carbon budget is in 2019. It's zero in 2050. In a linear format, you got to get to zero, and you guys figure out what it is. And each department needs to start doing a carbon budget. And I, just, I don't think we have the data. I mean, we you know the, in our greenhouse gas emissions, we're missing the commercial sector. We don't have the data for gasoline. We got the gasoline from traffic counts. It's about five permanent counting stations. We have those permanent counting stations. PDPC then did a model for how many vehicle miles do we expect to travel based on those five counting stations. We then converted on expected average um, fuel emission standards. That is 20 steps removed from reality. And that's the state of the art. We're as good as most communities out there. But we just don't have a lot of those things. And so it's what are the steps? And so just, just quickly, I won't be more in a second, but you know, we want to get to net zero in 2020. So a similar policy, this kind of thing for the mayor, which I think one of the core things is we want it to be a, a, a worst case linear. We don't want to, you know, we don't wait to 2049 and then wake up. So we want to say we need to get there. We want to do the carbon budget. We want this to be a lens for capital improvements program. So I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that when the fire chief wants a new half million dollar ladder truck, we're going to say it has to be electric. But at least it should be part of the conversation that, that's before them. Um, we want to talk about high impact practices, right? You know, what are the things that we do that really by themselves count a lot? But then we want to talk about across the board practices. Everything from street trees we're talking about tonight to land use as well as electrification of buildings and um, decarbonization of, of fuel supplies. So, you know, it's across the board. Thinking about the total footprint. 
so we don't look at decisions made in isolation. You know, what, you know it, it, we always talk about this for downtown, for example. If stormwater, which you don't think of it as greenhouse gas, but if we're really strict about stormwater downtown, it's hard, harder to build a new building downtown, and people go out and build in suburban areas, and there's more cars driving out there. So everything we do sort of ties together. So how do we do that piece? The co-benefits, right? We're trying to make, you know, this isn't just about surviving climate change, it's about making this a better city in spite of climate change. How do we build those things? Um, and then the, the equity, you talked about this a little bit for electric cars, but how do we talk about equity both for frontline communities, right? Who's being screwed the most by climate change? And then, you know, who are they serving? So it, it's, I want to come back to that framework and the lack of knowledge. It's just lots of stuff we do. So we can certainly come up, take us up in the next meeting, but I, think, yeah, I, I want you to know why you're going to push back. It's not that I don't, don't respect any of the comments and all the great comments. It's just it's not, it's not where we are. And then the final one, frankly, is we've started the resources to do some of those things. And so I don't want to respond uh, to things unequally. Okay, we've got some um, 30 seconds or less? Yeah, no, you got 30 seconds. So I have heard you um, describe this this way before, and the piece around having departments develop their own plans, they have a kind of metric, you know, that they have to sit under, essentially. Um, so what I think is missing, then, in the, the kind of narrative that leads to that in the plan is education of city departments, so they actually understand, yep. you know, all of the... Uh, the meaning behind this, this, this uh, what do you call it, you know, top metric that they have, that they have to work yeah, under. Yeah. And, and to be clear, I, I'm not defending this as a finished product. So we have lots of comments. So what this is, is the end of the consulting project. It now then turns over to my office and consultation. So all those 50 pages of comments, we're going to pour through. I have an intern now who's, she's a Smith student. All she's doing for 10 hours a week through the entire semester's updating it. So there's lots of comments. The executive summary is horrible. I think it doesn't have a good job of telling the story. So I, I'm not trying to minimize the, the opportunity for comments. I just, the things we're not going to go incredibly in the weeds are those things that we're just not ready for. But, but don't hold back the comments. I'm sorry. I think the, uh, oh, sorry, are you done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the MCAN comments that were presented, or the first part of that is really uh, important around um, not having contradictory statements around you know, planning for 2050, we need to make big jumps to get there. Like we need to make every decision now has to reflect that future. Absolutely. And that's like that last pause we were just talking about. Like we're investing in infrastructure now, it's going to be here in 40 years. So how do we make sure if it is a framework that every decision is going through this lens? Absolutely. And, and, and that's that to me is the core piece. And that's that's why I get worried about making it too long a plan that you the you lose the forest for the trees. Yeah. And like last night at the counselor debate around climate, I mean, both the, the uh, gentleman I watched were like, this is the most important problem we have, which I think is more and more becoming a, a common theme, and I think we all agree with that. So, like, if so, then, yeah, literally every decision needs to be looked through this. Right, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, I mean, that being the case, I, I guess what, like, my biggest picture comment is about, like, the sort of lack of urgency on the 2030 sort of mm -hmm. timeline and I mean I don't I don't think linear trajectory between now and 2050 is is an option at all like we need exponential action between now and 2030 the high cost or high whatever path option um, it says to be on pace to meet the 2050 target we need to reduce emissions in 2030 by 193,000. The high case scenario only reduces emissions by 132,000. Yeah, those are MCAN's comments too, is that we lay it out beginning, but then the... Well, I think they thought the high case got us or we need it by 2030, but it doesn't. If you do the math, it, do, it doesn't even get us. Uh, it's 60,000 tons short of the minimum we need to be on track. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I don't think it's going to be a linear, linear thing at all. It's going to follow a, a, a steep drop curve that flattens out over time as there are big legacy things that we slowly are replacing um, or things that are just very difficult to overcome technologically. But that the 
co-opted emissions that we can get to in 10 years should be 90 percent. I, I don't think there's any reason we can't. Get that's not what this plan. I know, and that's a big problem I have with it. Uh, I really we need to be at net zero in 2030. That that is a, so I can tell you from like a national standpoint when I go and listen to the utility companies and the federal government speak, they expect to have a fully two directional smart grid in the next 12 years and the reason that it's 12 years is that every piece of the utility grid will break and be replaced over the next 12 years and so as things break and they're replaced with modern technology that allows for two-way flow of electrons the utility companies and the government expect that we will have a fully functional two bi-directional utility grid within 12 years which means that all of the technologies that we're now looking at will function as designed within 12 years with doing nothing just by replacing things as they break. So if we're going to be a leader and try to push the envelope and not just go with the flow, we need to do way better than this. This is a go with the flow plan. That's correct. And that's kind of something that we can do in this plan. And, and Wayne, my big picture item for this is that it just takes more resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, know, you just have to open up a whole new look at how do you generate, you know, where do you work? What, what, what resources do you direct at this? Right. It's the Benson bill. Yeah, yeah it could yeah, be. Yeah. That could be the Benson bill, yes. <laughs> We're going to try. Yeah. I just said pass the Benson, pass the Benson, Benson oh, yeah. bill, but it's going to give you more resources. Right. What's that? It's a carbon, carbon oh, price. Right. Chris, before this people pass, when would that meeting be two weeks after? Uh, our next one would be October 10th. Is the next schedule is the second Thursday, unless the commission wants to change it. Perfect for me, I'm available, so I like that. Okay, so then October 10th, sounds like October 10th is it. And what we'll be doing is, you know, as this merged with comments, we're, we're setting a revised version before the meeting. Okay. It's not going to look totally different, so feel free to keep reading the plan, but it will look somewhat different. Okay, good. And we first in What's that? It will be first in the You will be first in yeah. first. Yeah. first I will try to keep the agenda open. Motion. Actually, I think we will be second. Second. I think motion will be seconded. Rich people are first. <laughs>